And uh, power went out at 1 o'clock today. I thought, Lord, you wanted me to get to the church early today. So I got to the church, and uh, about 2.30, Noelle called me. She said, the battery in my van's dead. I thought, well, I'll be there in a few minutes. So that's why the Lord let me out of work early today, was so I could go home and crank my wife's van. So it's been a fun day for me. All right, let's all stand. Hopefully you got your prayer list there. Uh, we're going to sing another scripture song tonight, Psalm 34, 1 through 4. It's on the back of your prayer list this evening. We've sung this a few times. Now, I, I was talking to Brother Sean this afternoon. I want to encourage you to sing loud, okay? We uh, sung that one last week that I will call upon the Lord. Uh, Alonzo, if I've got to call you out again, it will be bad, I promise. Um, we sang I will call upon the Lord last week. And uh, I couldn't really hear many of you singing, so I want y'all to try to sing loud. You may not know the tune very well. We'll sing it a couple of times, and uh, you'll, you'll get the hang of it. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make her boast in thee, Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord, and he heard me, and delivered me from all my fears. I like this verse, the end of that line, it says, I sought the Lord, and he heard me. I'm glad he hears us, amen? I'm glad he cares about us. The Bible says, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Not only does he hear us, not only does he listen to us, Brother Beckham, he cares about us, and I'm thankful for that this evening. All right, let's sing that once again. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make her boast in thee, Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord, and he heard me, and delivered me from all my fears. Good singing, church. Grab your red hymn book. All righty, let's go ahead and grab you a red hymn book, and let's turn to page number uh, 54, page number 54. <clears throat> there will be a happy meeting in heaven, I know. When we see the many loved ones we've known here below Gathered on the blessed hilltops with hearts all aglow That will be a glad reunion day Glad day, a wonderful day Glad day, a glorious day there with all the holy angels and loved ones to stay. That will be a glad reunion day. There within the holy city we'll sing and rejoice. Praising Christ the blessed Savior with heart and with voice. Tell him how we came to love him and make him our choice. That will be a glad reunion day. Glad day, a wonderful day. Glad day, a glorious day. There with all the holy angels and loved ones to stay. That will be a glad reunion day. When we leave a million years in that wonderful place, 
Basking in the love of Jesus, beholding his face. It will seem but just a moment of praising his grace. That will be a glad reunion day. Glad day, a wonderful day. Glad day, a glorious day. There with all the holy angels and loved ones to stay. That will be a glad reunion day. Let's turn over to page 220. 220. I don't know about you, neighbor, but I'm looking forward to that day. Amen. 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 <clears throat> Think about it as we sing it. <clears throat> There's a holy and beautiful city whose builder and ruler is God. John saw it descending from heaven When Patmos sin exile he trod Its high massive walls are of jasper The city itself is pure gold And when my tilted hair is folded Mine eyes shall its glory behold In that bright city Pearly white city, I have a mansion and harp and a crown. Now I am watching, waiting and longing for the white city that's soon coming down. No sin is allowed in that city. And nothing defiling nor me. No pain and no sickness can enter. No crepe on the doorknob is seen. Her sorrows and cares are forgotten. No tempter is there to annoy. No parting words ever are spoken. There's nothing to hurt or destroy In that bright city, pearly white city I have a mansion and harp and a crown Now I am watching, waiting and longing for the white city that's soon coming down. No heartaches are known in that city. No tears ever moisten the eye. There's no disappointments in heaven. No envy and strife in the sky. <coughs> the saints are all sanctified holy. They live in sweet harmony there. My heart is now set on that city, and someday its blessings I'll share. In that bright city, pearly white city, I have a mansion and harp and a crown. Now I am watching, waiting, and longing for the white city that's soon coming down. My loved ones are gathering yonder, my friends too are passing away, and soon I shall join that bright number and dwell in eternity's day. They're safe now in glory with Jesus. Their trials and battles are past. They've overcame sin and the tempter. They've reached that fair city at last. In that bright city, pearly white city, I have a mansion and harp and a crown. Now I am watching, 
waiting and longing for the white city that's soon coming down. Let's go ahead and talk about some prayer requests this evening. I can find a pen here to write with. Uh, continue to be praying for Jeremy Coomer, that's Sister Tina's son. I don't have any updates on him. I think she took him to the... Does anybody know what kind of an appointment he had last week that Sister Tina took him to? Any of you know for sure? I know she took him up there. I don't know if it was a lung appointment or what it was, but uh, be praying for him. He, they found that spot on his lung. Uh, continue to pray for Sister Marlene with her. Uh, in, I, I wrote pending. I meant to write impending because she said they're going to make her get her knee replaced. Um, she had that shot a couple weeks ago, acted like it was doing some better for her, um, but she is going to have to have her knee replaced. Be praying for her. Uh, continue to pray for Alan and Jennifer Shirley. That's uh, Sister Michelle's son and uh, daughter-in-law, they brought, they've got those three kids. They were actually here Sunday, and uh, be praying for them. Uh, Brother Joe had requested prayer for Michael Lewis. That was your co-worker. How's he doing? Do you know? Okay. Just be praying for him. He was diagnosed with cancer. Uh, continue to pray for Brother Richard. How did that go, sis? Has he had that biopsy yet that you mentioned? The 18th. All right. So be praying for Brother Richard. He's having that biopsy on the 18th. Um, you had requested pray for the pray. You'd requested prayer for the Ray family, right? Okay, so be praying for them, the Ray family. Uh, is it Mickey or Mikey? Mickey. Mickey. I thought. Okay, so be praying for the Mickey Ray family. His wife passed away. Um, Braden Miller, a uh, young man, he had been riding the bus. He sits up here on the front row uh, with Brother Luke. Uh, his grandmother passed away. Saturday, I think, is when he told me. So be praying for the Miller family. Be praying for Braden. And uh, continue to be praying for Kyle. So he's in rehab right now. Um, uh, Sister Tabitha posted that update in the Unity Group. Uh, I don't know when he's doing the next swallow test. I think that's the next step that they're waiting on. Is that right, Caleb? Do you know? Your brother's – has he done that second swallow test your mom mentioned yet? Okay. So he passed the swallow test. So we praise the Lord for that. Uh, just be praying for Kyle that he'll get to come home soon, okay? All right. Brother Joe, who was it you requested prayer for? Yeah. Brother Joe's cousin, Lisa Foley, passed away. So be praying for the Foley family. All right. Somebody else with a prayer request this evening. So if it's anything like mine, this echo will determine whether or not she gets the pacemaker defibrillator, correct? Yep. And when's her, when is that? Her echo is on Monday. So be praying for Jen Lobb. She's going to be having an echocardiogram on Monday. Me and Sister Jen's essentially going through the same thing, only she's a few more years ahead of me in life. <laughs> Had low EF, bad heart function. And uh, she's wearing this, this, this same stupid man vest that I've got on under my clothes. I went to leave earlier in the church van and it started dinging at me. I don't know if you've ever tried to adjust tight-fitting clothes under dress clothes under a vest with the impending doom of a shock, but it was nerve-wracking to say the least. <laughs> so be praying for Sister Jen Lobb. She's got her echocardiogram on Monday. And uh, like I said, depending on what they find out in that, that echocardiogram, We'll determine whether or not she has to have her pacemaker slash defibrillator installed. So be praying for her. All right, somebody else with a prayer request this evening. Yeah, brother. Amen. Do you know what her name is? All right. All right. Be praying for Christopher Bunk. He's a lost man that brother's been witnessing to. And to be praying for Fred Thomas' daughter, who's a Hindu. Somebody else this evening. Carla. On the street, uh, Linda Moss, she's out there with us. And I plan on asking Linda and asking her if she's going to be Oh. 
What was his last name? Howard Britt. Howard Britt. All right, be praying for Howard Britt. That he's got pancreatic cancer. I'll be praying for Austin Glenn and his family. His grandma has cancer. His aunt, I'm sorry. And be praying for Sister Brandy. She's homesick this evening. Somebody else with a prayer request. Brother. That was the last name. Uh, oh, his first name's Carmichael. Okay. Be praying for Carmichael and his family. Somebody else. Lonzo. Amen. Be praying for the students. Amen. Somebody, Sister Debbie. How's he doing? She's taking it personally, isn't she? How dare you get better faster than I did? Hey, man, be praying for Jeff McCorder. He's he had the. Did they did they do a spine? Was it his whole spine, or just a certain area of it? Okay. Yeah. She's good. Yeah. So be praying for Jeff McCorder as he continues to improve from his spinal fusion surgery. And be praying for Sister Linda that the screw in hers won't come out. Somebody else. Yep. You said that, and I heard you say it, and then it left me. Uh, Brother Tony and is over at New Water this evening. Um, he's preaching for them tonight. That's why we've got these young men upstairs. Uh, so be praying for Brother Tony as he preaches and traveling mercies this evening. All right. Let's go ahead and make your way to the altar if you can. Hopefully you got that prayer list and wrote these names and requests down. Be praying for our missionaries. Be praying for... Each one be praying for the Daney family as they leave the mission field and uh, be praying for the Daney as he tries to get over the stroke that he had, as he tries to improve from that. Be praying for the ministries of our church, the nursing home ministry, the adult daycare ministry, uh, many avenues. The Lord has allowed us to go out and to preach the gospel to this lost and dying world and to pray for one another. Pray for the service tonight. Pray for Brother Sean. Lord, we thank you for everything you've done for us, Father, and the, the blessings you've bestowed upon us. Lord, I just thank you for another opportunity to be in your house this evening, God. Lord, we thank you for a place where we can call home, where we can come and worship you. Father, where we don't have to worry about somebody, Lord, standing at the door, turning us away. Or we don't have to worry about somebody coming in and breaking in while we're trying to have church and taking us to jail, God. We thank you for the freedoms that we have. And God, I ask you to continue to give us that. Lord, we ask you to touch these prayer requests this evening. Lord, I pray you touch Brother Sean as he preaches tonight. Lord, I pray you give him liberty. Lord, give him clarity of mind, clarity of speech. Lord, to say what you'd have him to. God, Lord, I pray you touch each and every person in the service tonight. Lord, they'd be receptive of the word. Lord, I pray everybody's come looking for something tonight, God. Uh, Lord, that's important for us, Lord, to come looking for something. Lord, we know that you're talking to us. Lord, you're trying to lead us. Lord, I pray you'd help us to listen to you and to follow your word. Lord, I pray you touch these requests this evening. Lord, I pray you touch Brother Jeremy, Lord, as he's dealing with that spot on his lung and, Lord, the, the sickness that he's been going through and had. Lord, I pray you'd help him as he goes through this, God. Lord, we don't have an update on that, but, Lord, you know the situation. 
Lord, I pray you'd touch him. Lord, I pray you'd touch just Marlene's knee. Uh, Lord, we thank you that the shot did some good for her. And, uh, Lord, I pray you'd touch her, Lord, that she wouldn't have to have the surgery too soon. And, uh, Lord, when she does have to have it, you'd give her mercy, Lord, and you give her healing from that. Lord, I pray you'd touch uh, Alan and Jennifer, God. Lord, I pray you'd touch them as they brought those kids into their home. Lord, I pray you'd help them to draw closer to you, Lord, to get back in church. Lord, I pray you'd touch Michael Lewis, Lord, Brother Joe's co-worker that has cancer. God, I pray you'd help him and uh, touch him in this time. I pray you touch Brother Richard, Lord, as he goes for his biopsy on the 18th. Uh, Lord, we ask you to help him with that. Lord, you get a clear report from that. And Lord, uh, touch him. Lord, I pray you'd touch uh, uh, the Ray family, God, with the passing of uh, uh, Mickey's wife. Lord, I pray you'd help them. Lord, I pray you'd touch them in this time of need. Lord, I pray you'd touch Braden and Lord, his family. Lord, his grandparents and his parents. God, as his mother's mom passed away. Lord, I pray you'd touch them as they go through the valley of the shadow of death. Lord, I pray you'd wrap them up and give them some peace. Lord, I pray you'd touch Kyle, Lord, as he's still in rehab. Lord, I, we thank you for the good report of him passing the swallow test. And, uh, Lord, all the tests he's passed so far, God. And, uh, Lord, I pray you just help him, Lord, that he get to come home sooner rather than later. And, uh, Lord, help his speech and, Lord, the strength on his body. Lord, as I know he's still pretty weak from uh, laying in that bed for so long, we just ask you to help him, God. Lord, we ask you to touch Brother Tony this evening as he's preaching over at New Water. Lord, I pray you'd help him and uh, use him to be a blessing over there. Lord, I pray you touch Jeff McCorder, Lord, as he improves and re recuperates from his spinal surgery. And, uh, Lord, we ask you to help him with that. We ask you to touch Sister Linda, Lord, with the, uh, the screw that's backing out on hers. Lord, I pray you'd help her, Lord, that that wouldn't come out any further and uh, she wouldn't have to have any other surgeries. Lord, we ask you to touch Sister Brandy this evening, Lord, at home sick. Lord, we ask you to help her, give her some reprieve from that. Lord, we ask you to touch Austin Glenn's family, Lord, as his aunt has cancer. And Lord, we ask you to touch Howard Britt as well, Lord, when he's been diagnosed with that pancreatic cancer. Help him as he starts his chemo treatments and radiation. Lord, we ask you to touch uh, Carmichael and his family. Lord, we ask you to give them strength and help. And, uh, Lord, we just ask you to touch them. Lord, we ask you to touch the students, Lord, of our school system. Lord, we ask you to help the ones that we have that go into the school, Lord, to be a witness and a light and a guide for you. And, uh, Lord, help them to be a, a light in this lost and dying world. Lord, we ask you to touch Brother Joe's cousin, Lord, uh, uh, Linda's Fo uh, Linda Foley's family, Lord, as she passed away. We ask you to help them, give them that peace, Lord, that passeth understanding. We ask you to touch Sister Jen, Lord, as she goes for her echocardiogram next week. Uh, Lord, we pray for good results on that, that the medicine and, Lord, everything she's been doing will, uh, Lord, have improved her heart function. Lord, we ask you to touch Christopher Bunk, Lord, that lost man. Lord, we thank you that the gospel was shared with him. And, uh, Lord, we pray that you'd water it, Lord, that you'd make it grow and, Lord, take hold in his life. And, Lord, he'd come to know you in the free pardon of sin. Uh, Lord, we ask you to touch Fred Thomas's daughter, Lord, got into a, a false religion. Lord, we ask you to help her and bring her back into the fold. And, uh, Lord, we just ask you to touch those. Lord, again, we ask you to bless this service. Help us to be attentive to the word tonight. Lord, help us to get something from you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Good evening. It's good to be back in church. Amen. Amen. Well, Brother Tyler's happy to be here. Hey, Brother Zach's happy to be here. Amen. I know it's been rainy, but it's still a good day. Amen. 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 All right. John chapter 6 this evening. John chapter number 6. Look back in uh, our study we dealt with a couple weeks ago. In a miracle meal, as we look at the feeding of the 5,000, uh, and this miracle that is performed by Jesus Christ. Now, I find it ever intriguing when you look at commentaries how that there are individuals that will uh, criticize or uh, contend that these are not actual things that have happened. I always think it's funny how man thinks he's smarter than he really is. Uh, it's, it's intriguing to me, individuals that would rather spend most of their time correcting what this Bible says than believing what this Bible says. Uh, I'll say this, God knows more than man knows. 
Amen. And he is far more capable of performing uh, a feeding of well over 5,000 individuals than man ever dreamt of. And so we appreciate, uh, appreciate the scriptures. Amen. The inspiration of the scriptures, uh, the preservation of our scriptures in this King James Bible. Thank God for what he has given us. Amen. Uh, don't ever overlook the word of God. It is a key factor and a key attribute or aspect in the Christian's life. If you're going to live a life uh, for God, God, you're going to have to have his word and you're going to have to read it and you're going to have to believe it amen it's simple as that friend amen so let's dive into John chapter number six this evening uh, we'll start in verse number one I'll read all the way down through verse 15 we've already dealt with the first seven verses but we'll look uh, at an overview of those verses as we read through them. Verse number one. After these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias, and a great multitude followed him because they saw his miracles, which he did on them that were diseased. And Jesus went up into a mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. And the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was nigh. When Jesus then lifted up his eyes and saw a great company come unto him, he saith unto Philip, Whence shall we buy bread? that these may eat. And this he said to prove him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, Two hundred penny worth of bread is not sufficient for them, that every one of them may take a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, saith unto him, There is a lad here which hath five barley loaves and two small fishes, but what are they among so many? And Jesus said, Make the men sit down. Now there was much grass in the place so the men sat down in number about 5,000. And Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed to the, to the disciples and the disciples to them that were set down, and likewise of the fishes as much as they would. When they were filled, he said unto his disciples, Gather up the fragments that remain, that nothing be lost. Therefore they gathered them together and filled twelve baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves which remained over and above unto them that had eaten. Then those men, when they had seen the miracle that Jesus did, said, This is of a truth, that prophet that should come into the world. When Jesus therefore perceived that they would come and take him by force, to make him a king, he departed again into a mountain himself alone. As we looked at, we are seeing how that the Lord has went back up to Galilee <clears throat> from the previous chapter and how that he has uh, uh, made his way back northward and how that uh, in doing so he has made his way into what is probably the conclusion or the end part of his Galilean ministry. You'll remember that uh, it would only last about a year, a year and a half uh, in time frame. And so uh, really when you deal with the gospel of John, you're looking at uh, that very short ministry of Jesus Christ and even the latter end of that ministry for the most part. As I stated last time, you'll understand that uh, when you get to chapters 12 and 13, you're really dealing with at least the last couple days before Jesus is crucified or even the last hours before Jesus is crucified leading up to the cross. And so as you deal with these things, we'll see that uh, how many of you believe uh, nothing is in your Bible by accident? When he dealt with in the previous chapter, he dealt with authority and he was, it was a, a proof of his authority and what you'll see is this, as he dives into chapter number 6, you'll see that the theme is bread throughout the chapter, uh, but what you'll find is that it is the provision of God and his supply and his provision and how that he is capable and able and how that he is the only individual uh, that is able to give man what he needs. Right. It's because of who he is, amen? amen? Remember this, Jesus Christ is God. I know many modern day versions are against that and many uh, modern day Christians would say differently but Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. Amen. Amen. He is the Son of God. And so as you go throughout these things, uh, what we are looking at is we are looking at a, a great miracle that is before us. Uh, but what you find in this miracle is that there is an insufficiency found in mankind. 
You'll look down in uh, verse number seven. As, as Jesus is already presented to Philip, said in verse five, he said this, whence shall we buy bread that these may eat? Verse seven, Philip answered him, 200 penny worth of bread is not sufficient for them that every one of them may take a little. Now we went through a quick study last time and we talked about how that the number 200 uh, in the Bible represents insufficiency and what you find out in this aspect is this, that man was not able to provide a sufficient amount of food uh, to feed this great crowd uh, that had come to them. And may I say this, when you deal with man Man is always insufficient in his ability uh, to take care of not only spiritual needs, uh, but carnal, fleshly needs. Uh, understand this, you in and of yourself are incapable of doing anything without Jesus Christ. He said this, without me, ye can do nothing. Now, nothing's pretty broad. Meaning like, it's kind of like the word all, meaning like you're not going to get anything done without Jesus Christ. It is the necessity of mankind that we must know Christ. And so there is an insufficiency uh, that is seen in mankind and that is that is noticed by Philip uh, there in verse number seven uh, when we dealt with that number 200 and the, uh, that being a, a penny being about the, a day's wage according to our New Testament and uh, finding out that this was likely uh, up, uh, upwards of two thirds of a year's wages he said that's not even enough to take care of this people notice the end of verse seven he said that they may take a little he said, that's not it. If we, if we were to buy enough bread right now at this moment with 200 penny worth, he said it wouldn't even be enough that they'd be able, that each individual would be able to take a little. What you are seeing is you are seeing the insufficiency of mankind to provide the needs of the crowd, this multitude that have gathered in this place. And as I've already stated, may I say it again, a man is insufficient in and of himself. What we need is we need God to intervene in our situations to help us. It is the necessity in mankind's life. You know what happened when we needed a savior? God sent his son. Amen. You know what happens every time you have a great need in your life? God intervenes in a manner that's likely unseen by you. Amen. You ever, pray, you ever had a prayer request and asked God uh, to intervene in a situation? And he, he does. He intervenes in a way that you didn't even see him doing it. <laughs> you ever wonder why that is? It's likely because he knows better than you know. You ever told God how he should fix your problem? God, I've got this problem. This is exactly how you need to fix it. And he does so, but he doesn't do it the way you thought it should have been done. <laughs> That's because he's far wiser than we are. Amen. Amen. Far wiser far wiser than we are. And so let's dive into verses 8 and 9 uh, this evening and we'll dive, read throughout, uh, go down through verse number 15, uh, read a concluding of this message. This will be part two of a miracle meal. And so let's look at the skepticism found here in verses 8 and 9. Now as you see si uh, Andrew, he is Simon Peter's brother. You'll remember how that si uh, Andrew was the individual uh, that actually told Simon Peter about the Lord Jesus Christ. And so Andrew has now come and he says this in verse 8, one of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter, Peter's brother saith unto him, There is a lad here which hath five, lo uh, five barley loaves and two small fishes. He said this, But what are they among so many? May I say this, when you look at this individual and the skepticism, you're looking at letter A, an unlikely source of provision for these people. He said this, There is a lad here. Now it is intriguing to me uh, that the only individual in over 5,000 men or around 5,000 men uh, likely there being women and children as well in the congregation in the multitude uh, that in all of that great multitude one young lad is the only individual that had enough sense to bring food to the meeting. 
amen. You want to know how this wasn't a Baptist meeting? Because there wasn't much food there. Amen. Amen. One lad is the only individual uh, that brought food to this place. Uh, but what you see is this, uh, that God is going to provide from a very unlikely source. He is going to take mu a little and he's going to make much out of little. He's going to take what is offered and he's going to do a great work out of what is given to him. And so it is an unlikely source, uh, but it is an unsatisfactory supply as well. Uh, we see this. He said he hath five barley loaves and two small fishes. Now, as I've, I've studied and looked at these things, what you find of those barley loaves is that they really are small portions of bread. Uh, they're kind of a flat bread, and so and they are uh, somewhat hard. And so as you look at these things, even in this lad's lunch, in these five barley loaves and these two small fishes, you're seeing that it's not really a satisfying lunch. Uh, what you're seeing is this, uh, that in, in, its, in its magnitude, there's just no not much there. As a matter of fact, I would dare say that this lad could have handled and eaten uh, this meal and likely still been hungry when he got done. There's just not much there. And so it is an unsatisfactory supply. And as Andrew brings this in, uh, what he says is, is, he says, I've got this lad here uh, which hath five barley loaves and two small fishes, and he is presenting this uh, with a, uh, I would dare say, an attitude of skepticism because he would go on to say this, uh, but what are they among so many? And so we see an unsuspecting son of what, what are they among so many? Almost to present it as this. Yeah, we've got this, but that's not enough to get the job done in this, in this situation, in these circumstances that we are facing. And so it is interesting to me how that even his disciples that have seen Jesus Christ bring forth and wrought some great miracles already thus far in his, in the, in his ministry uh, that they have now become so short-sighted to think he can't get it done here. That's what it appears. When he, looked, when he looks at it, he said, but what are they among so many? You'll remember how that this is the only miracle that is mentioned in all four Gospels and how that in the other Gospels, the disciples had bid Jesus to send the multitude away that they might go get something to eat because they didn't think provision could be made for this people. Isn't it like man to be short-sighted? That's the problem with man often is we can only see what's sitting in front of us. But we have a God that can see the end from the beginning and he knows every aspect of it along the way. And with him being high and lifted up, I don't know if you know this, but when you're high and lifted up, you have a better vantage of what's happening below you. He can see what's around you better than you can. He can see your needs better than you can. He can see exactly what needs to happen and he has presented this question here in verse 5, when shall we buy bread that these may eat? Almost with an a, a introspection into his disciples' life to say this, how do you think we ought to do this? And they have no answer. Can I tell you there are going to be times when you're going to go to man and man is not going to have a solution for you. Men will let you down. But what you're looking at is a God who will not do it. Amen. So we see the skepticism. Let's look at their separation in verse number 10. Their separation. And Jesus said, make the men sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down in number about 5,000. Uh, now it is intriguing as uh, Mark says this in Mark 640, he said, and they sat down in ranks by hundreds and by fifties. And so there are separations uh, of fifties, groups of fifties uh, of these men. And now as you look at these things, understand this, uh, that they are still in the mountain or around the mountain 
them that you saw in verse number three as they as he is dealing with his disciples and that multitude has gathered around them and he has found a grassy place for these individuals to sit down on. Uh, but what you see is this, uh, that there is an order in his directions. May I say this? The work of God has order to it. Right. Amen. It's not just you go, you fly by the seat of your pants, you figure it out as you go. Uh, what you'll find is this, that the work of God has a structure to it. Amen. And it is structured and given by God in his word. You say, how do we conduct ourselves in church? We conduct ourselves the way the Bible tells us to conduct ourselves. Uh, why do we, uh, why do we, uh, have you ever thought about this? Why do you uh, put a preacher above on a pulpit with a pulpit? It's because when you get to the book of Ezra, Ezra is presented in that manner as standing before the people uh, on a wooden platform uh, or with a pulpit and he begins to read the word of God to them. Uh, you say, uh, well, they don't, they don't make him a preacher. No, he was a priest or a, uh, a, an individual that wrote down a scribe by trade and by heritage. But as you look at these things, what you're seeing is that God has order and structure to his plan and his work. Amen. Amen. Can I tell you, it's a bunch of garbage when it's run by the emotions and the feelings of mankind. That's dangerous because feelings and emotions, you never know what they'll be like. Right. Amen. You might love country ham today and then wake up like Brother Zach and not be able to eat it anymore. I'm sure you still love it, though. I know, I know you do. You can't trust your feelings, friend of mine. You can't trust your heart. Amen. What we do must be based on the scriptures and it must be guided and directed by God himself. Amen. Amen. That's why we have a final authority in all matters of faith and practice that directs us. It is intriguing to me that as Jesus, uh, he commands these individuals in a structured manner to sit down by 50s and by hundreds according to Mark 6 uh, and that these individuals are supposed to be in this, in this place and they're supposed to do what God to, uh, tells them to do. Can I tell you, when the Lord tells you to do something, the best thing you can do is do what he said. Amen. I feel like I've harped on it for a while, but we'll say it again. Obedience is expected by God. It is expected. You say, how could he expect that from me? Because he bought you with a price. What was that price? It was his blood. Amen. The blood of who? Jesus Christ. Right. On Calvary, where he paid for your sins. Amen. Amen. Sins he didn't commit, they are your sins. Yes, but he loved you enough for that. Amen. There is a required obedience in this structure, in this order that Jesus has directed. So we saw the skepticism, the separation. Let's look at the supply in verse number 11. The supply in verse number 11. And Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed to the disciples and to the disciples to them, uh, and the disciples to them that were set down, and likewise of the fishes as much as they would. Intriguing, <clears throat> intriguing words here. But let's look at Jesus used what was given to him. In Matthew 14 and verse number 18, Jesus said this. He said, bring them hither to me, referring to the, uh, to the loaves, uh, the five barley loaves and the two small fishes. And so he is required uh, that they bring this, this small meal of a lad uh, to him. And what he is going to do is he is going to use what has been given to him. Can I tell you, that's what the Lord wants to do with you as well. Amen. He wants to use you, but he wants you to give yourself to him. Right. Had that lad walked away with his meal, I have no doubt in my mind that the Lord would have found another way to provide for that multitude. But that young lad would have missed out on the blessing. Can I tell you, the Lord wants to use you 
in your life. But what you find with a lot of individuals is that they are unwilling to yield themselves to him. A lot of times when you deal with man, man builds lines in his life. He'll say, I'll go this far, but I'm not going to go past that. Or there will be areas or sections of an individual's life and and they'll say things like this, God, you can have my entire life except for that. And can I tell you, God wants everything because he's given you everything. I mean, it's all his. When you look in your Bible, what you'll find is you'll find the, uh, the, the doctrine or the idea of stewardship, and that idea is this, uh, that nothing is yours. It's all his. Amen. 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 It's all his. You, you understand? No, no, no. He owns it. You say, what's he own? The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Amen. Everything that you can see is God's. Everything above us is God's. Right. You say, why is that? Because he created all of it. And last time I checked, when you create it, you own it, friend of mine. It's yours. And so God has bought and purchased the earth uh, with, it, with the title deed thereof uh, because he gave his life for it uh, to, de- uh, to deal with sin. And so as such, everything that he has given to his child is his. And what is expected is this, that you as a steward are to conduct the things that God has delivered to you in a manner that is pleasing to God. You say, what does that mean? What it means is is this, what you have is God's. The problem is, is when it becomes yours. Man's clingy. I mean, we love our objects, our, our shiny objects. Yeah. The problem, the problem, Brother Zach, is not stuff. Brother Gordon said it Sunday, Sunday morning. The problem is when stuff has you. And boy, it's, it's hard. Let me... Let me It's difficult at your all's age. Stuff is appealing. Stuff, that new truck. Right? That new object. No. Everybody except for this kid. Brother Tyler, that new bow. Yes. Yeah. That new deer stand, that new tree saddle. Yes, all all of these things. Yes. Stuff. Stuff is appealing. But the problem is is that we can get to the place to where it becomes overwhelmingly uh, drawing us to it. And so uh, that enters into covetousness and we begin to desire those things. And what you'll find is this, that those things get a grasp of us and what they become is they become a, a an idol in our lives to which we are not willing to give over to God or to allow him to have those things. Uh, what I've found in my life is this, uh, that when I've given everything to God, uh, he allows us to have some joy and some peace and some love uh, and to enjoy the things of this world, uh, but it's it's at this uh, it's in this aspect uh, that those things do not own me. Amen. Amen. Because when those things own you, that's when the problem becomes an issue. Right. Right. This lad, I want you to see what he did. He gave what he had Amen. to be used by the Lord. Verse 11, he said, and Jesus took the loaves. He took what was given to him. Can I tell you, the Lord wants to use what you have. That's why he gave it to you. Amen. 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 You know, not everybody in here is good at talking to people. Not everybody's good at talking to people. Some of us aren't. Some of us don't enjoy conversing with other people. Believe it or not, I'm one of those individuals. <laughs> That's how I know the Lord has a sense of humor because he called me to preach. Amen, Brother Beckham? Amen. I thought, I thought he laughed the entire time he did this. Uh, we'll find out when we get to heaven. Amen. But the Lord has given each and every one of us different abilities. 
Now, what the distinction is is this, that those abilities are to be used for his honor and his glory. And they are to be given to him to use at his will. And what you see is that Jesus took the loaves. But notice this, not only did he use what was given, but gratitude was showed. He said, and Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he had given thanks. You say, who was he giving thanks to? Well, one, what we find is that the Lord always pointed to the Father to give thanks for what is provided. But there is also a thanks that is given when you do what you're supposed to do. When you do what you're supposed to do. You see, this lad brings his food. He gives it to the Lord. The disciples take that. They bring it to the Lord. Jesus takes the loaves and he gives thanks. And then he begins to distribute that to the disciples. Can I tell you, there is a gratitude that is seen when you give the Lord what he has given you. The Lord appreciates it, amen? Amen. Now what we're missing in our day is gratitude. No doubt in my mind. This is an unthankful generation that we are living in. By the way, the Lord said it would be that way. Perilous times shall come. Men shall be unthankful. But when you see these things, what you see is you see a selfless action in the giving of what has been given to an individual. This lad gives his meal. So we see Jesus used what was given. Gratitude was shown. Let's look at guided distribution. He distributed to the disciples and the disciples to them that were set down. And likewise, of the fishes as much as they would. Now it's an intriguing idea uh, when you look at these things. Now it is possible that Jesus Christ just created more. It's possible. I believe Jesus Christ is the creating aspect of God. I believe he was there in the garden. Amen. I believe he was there when man was created. When you look in Genesis uh, uh, chapter number one, what you find uh, is this, uh, that, uh, that the Godhead is there in Genesis chapter one. Uh, in Genesis chapter two, as he begins to talk about the creation of mankind, uh, he, he would go on to say, let us make man in our own image. And so there is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit found uh, in creation. Uh, But what you'll find is this, that Jesus Christ is a critical aspect according to John chapter number one in the creation, in the creating portion uh, of God. And so uh, there is no doubt that he is capable of creating uh, out of nothing for he spoke all this into existence. But what you'll find with Jesus Christ is often this, He didn't really do a lot of creating throughout his ministry. But you'll find that he did a lot of multiplying. And he was going to take little in this aspect and he's about to make much out of it. And can I tell you, it's one of the greatest attributes of Jesus Christ. In his ability to take little and make much out of nothing. Amen. 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 Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed to the disciples, and the disciples to them that were set down, and likewise of the fishes as much as they would. Now it is intriguing, uh, as he begins to hand hand this bread and these fishes uh, to to these disciples, how that no doubt after a few moments, surely they would have thought, I have no idea where this uh, bread and where these fishes are coming from. As a matter of fact, as you get to the end of verse number 11, there's intriguing wording there as he said this, uh, that likewise of the fishes, listen, as much as they would. And so there was as much fish as all the entirety of this 5,000 men uh, would want to eat. And so there was enough fish 
that these individuals could eat as much of it as they wanted. Uh, go back to verse number 7 and look at when uh, Philip had brought forth the statement that he said 200 penny worth of bread is not sufficient for them that every one of them may take a little. And so it was Philip's idea uh, that only a little would be provided but you'll find out uh, that God always goes above and beyond what man is capable of. And so as you get to verse number 11 you'll find uh, that these fishes uh, they were given and as much as they would want right. he gave far more than what they thought they were going to get out of it and that is what happens when you're relying on God he always gives you far more than you thought you was going to get we see the supply let's look at the surplus verses 12 and 13 he said, when they were filled, he said unto his disciples, gather up the fragments that remain, that nothing be lost. Therefore they gathered them together and filled twelve baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves, which remained over and above unto them that had eaten. So look at their satisfaction. He said this, when they were filled. You know, we've come a long ways from Andrews, there's but a lad here in verse 9 that have five barley loaves and two small fishes. And now 5, 000, about 5,000 men have been fed. And it's not just a little, but he said that he had filled them. These individuals were full with what God had done for them. His provision, as I've already stated, was greater than what they thought they were getting. Their satisfaction, and may I say this, you'll only be satisfied with God. There is an insufficiency in man, but as he is going to prove throughout the remainder of this chapter, the only individual that is sufficient for you is Jesus Christ. He's the only one that you'll find satisfaction in. So their satisfaction, the standard, he said this, gather up the fragments that remain, that nothing be lost. Now I'll say this, and I'll move on, um, but that which God provides, he cares about. Amen. It's to be dealt with in a precious manner. Right. Amen. Can I tell you, Jesus doesn't do miracles just to do miracles. Amen. There's purpose behind them. There's an expectation and the things that he provides is expected to be taken care of. Amen. So I'll say this. Don't ever look at the things of God in a flippant manner. It's significant that Jesus Christ would do anything for us. It's significant that he would do anything for us. Gather up the fragments that remain that nothing be lost. Let's look at the sufficiency. He said, therefore, they gathered them together and filled 12 baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves, which remained over and above unto them that had eaten. And so there is a great gathering that has happened as the disciples have gone throughout the crowds in their split up condition, those uh, 50s and 100s. And so he's gone throughout the crowds and they have begun to gather up. And so there is enough bread that is gathered from this feeding of the 5,000 uh, that they gather up 12 baskets with the fragments that are left over. Before they started, there wasn't enough food to feed the 12 disciples. And now they've got enough fragments left in baskets to take care of each and every one of them. That which remained over and above unto them that had eaten. Once again, what you see is you see God's provision is greater than what man could provide. Let's look at their statement and we'll be finished. Their statement in verses 14 and 15, he said this, Then those men, when they had seen the miracle that Jesus did, said, This is of a truth, that prophet that should come into the world. And when Jesus therefore perceived that they would come and take him by force to make him a king, he departed again into a mountain himself alone. Notice their wonder by sight. They said this, When they had seen the miracle that Jesus did. Now you'll remember this <clears throat> in verse 2. 
how did he say this? That a great multitude followed him because they saw his miracles. Here in verse number 14, then those men, when they had seen the miracle that Jesus did, and so these individuals are stuck on what they are seeing, and that is going to have a great effect on their desire to make Jesus Christ a king. Now may I say this, Jesus, <clears throat> Jesus Christ is going to be a king one of these days. Right. I mean, he's king of kings and lord of lords right now. But one day he's coming to rule over this earth as the king over everything. But that's not what he came for here in John chapter 6. No, he's a lamb that is brought before the slaughter to be given for mankind. But what you see in these individuals is they are stuck on what they see. It's intriguing to me that what they see never makes it to their heart. They never get it. They're stuck on what they see. And can I tell you, it's a road bump for every man. Sight is a detriment to Christianity. That's why he said that we walk, walk by faith, not by sight. Because your sight will mess you up. Amen. Amen. When you look at our country, our country is a train wreck. Even after the election, whoever you wanted to win, if they won, if you didn't want the other one to if you wanted the other one to win, sorry about your luck. But he's not the one that won's not the savior of this country. The only hope these United States of America have is Jesus Christ. That's it. And if men don't put their faith in Jesus Christ and get born again, this place is going to get worse and worse. Amen. I've yet to read my Bible and find the United States of America in it. And there's prophecy that's yet to be fulfilled. So that's likely that we won't be here. That is what it is. Amen. But as you look at these things, these men are stuck on what they see. And what they see never gets down into their heart. And that is a detriment to this Christian life. Notice their wisdom by scripture. This is of a truth, that prophet that should come into the world. And I'll say this, they are likely referenced in Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 15 through 18, and also Genesis chapter 49 and verse number 10, a, a clear uh, prophecy concerning Jesus Christ and the gathering of the people to him. And you'll see that throughout a lot of the ministry of Jesus Christ, the people did gather to him to a certain point as he began to speak to them and that they would walk away from him and Jesus even turning to his disciples and saying this, uh, will ye also go away? And uh, Peter having that great statement, to whom shall we go for thou hast the words of life? A great statement that ought to be remembered uh, by each and every one of us uh, that Jesus Christ is the individual that has the words of life. Uh, but no doubt those prophecies linked, uh, pointed to Jesus Christ and that is the individual that they thought that they were uh, coming and that was why they desired in verse 15 uh, to make Make him a king. And when you see their will against the Savior, what you are seeing is this, that mankind's will is not the will of God. These men wanted to do something that was not the desire of God. When Jesus therefore perceived that they would come and take him by force to make him a king, he departed again into a mountain himself alone. And can I tell you this? You may try to force your will on God, but he doesn't have to accept your will. And Jesus Christ walked away from this people. Now, it's, it's intriguing to me because he could have set up a kingdom and condemned all of us to hell. And been just in doing so, by the way, because we're sinners, Amen. But he rejected their will for his father's will, knowing that a cross was what lay before him. The danger in these things is this. Sometimes you'll get to the place because of the blessings of God that you think you've got it all figured out. 
and you begin to act outside of his direction, just like this people did. The blessings were there. He's just fed 5,000 people. Listen, if there was a time to rejoice, it was that time. But instead of submitting themselves to him, they just thought they'd do their own thing, their own will, their own way. And what it would have ended in is a train wreck for them. God knows better than we know, amen? Amen. amen. All right, let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Father, we do appreciate your goodness and your mercy on our lives, Father. I pray that you'd help this Lord, simple lesson, Lord, scattered this evening uh, was my mind, Father. I pray that you would uh, help to give some clarity to what was said, Lord. I pray that you'd bless and work and help us, Lord, that we might be pleasing in your sight, God. I pray uh, that you do that which we cannot do. God, I can't touch hearts. I can't.